The homeland debate concerning Indo-European naturally presupposes that there is such a thing as the Indo-European language family. Now, for very many Hindus, it is controversial. That is very difficult to accept. Very often they think that the very notion of an Indo-European language family stretching deep into India, as well as all the way to Europe, automatically implies that the homeland is outside India and that there was an Aryan invasion to bring Sanskrit into India. Moreover, they think that it has to do with the British colonial conspiracy to dominate India, to pit Indians against one another. Well, those effects are only side effects that came afterwards. The origin of this whole theory uh, has a, a different story behind it. What Indians usually do know is that a British judge, William Jones, announced the existence of an Indo-European language family in 1786 in a speech in Kolkata. Now, he himself being very much a part of the British colonial setup might perhaps feed the uh, idea that this was part of a British conspiracy. However, he himself invented nothing. He had it from a French Jesuit called Gaston Laurent Coeurdoux, who in the preceding decades had developed this notion of a kinship between principally Sanskrit, Greek, and Latin, but also affecting uh, Germanic, Slavic, and other languages. The uh, French had lost a war, the Seven Years' War, against England, and they did not have much colonial ambition anymore in India. And so you can strike him out as a colonial conspirator, However, he was a missionary and pretty fanatical, pretty anti-Hindu. And so, whereas in the case of the French, the colonial enterprise did not mean much anymore, the missionary project, of course, was quite alive. So him too, you could suspect of ulterior motives. Nevertheless, his theory as it stands is unassailable. And so far, even though very many people have, uh, have uh, you know, spoken ill of the theory, none of them has refuted it. So very obviously, and I will not argue the whole point, but very obviously there are similarities even between the one non-Indian language that most Indians know, namely English, and Sanskrit like among the pronouns, uh, you have, for instance, tu, tuam, corresponds with English thou, or, for instance, among the numerals, you have dva, corresponding with tu, or tri, corresponding with three. So there are thousands of examples like this, which we can discuss in another context, but the point here is that you understand that there is reason for assuming this kinship between a number of European and a number of Indian languages. So this came about outside the colonial context. In fact, the um, first suspicions of this kinship were the product of occasional travelers uh, who came to India long before there was any colonial project. So they are quite innocent, and even if they weren't, you see, any ulterior motives could not change the validity of the theory itself. It seems that many Hindus don't like the whole idea of a comparison. 
because they think that a comparison detracts from the unicity of the Sanskrit tradition. The whole idea that there was something related to Sanskrit or even anterior to Sanskrit, which is what the ancestor language Proto-Indo-European would have to be, that, uh, well, is felt like belittling Hindu culture. Unfortunate, and I think wrong, uh, the history is what it is, and the Sanskritic civilization has still a lot going for it. But nevertheless, it is part of human history, so there is something that came before. There is a pre-Vedic, a pre-Sanskritic state, even a pre-Indo-European stage. You see, this, uh, nowadays, linguistics has advanced farther, and there are far more ancient reconstructed languages that supposedly are ancestors of Indo-European, of Dravidian, of Uralic and other language families. Now, once the linguistic kinship was established, then the hunt for a homeland started because it is unlikely that such a large language family could have originated in such a large territory. Far more logical is that it started in a small territory and then expanded. Now, originally, everybody assumed that that homeland was India. This is partly because of the role that Sanskrit played in the discovery of the whole language family. Partly also because the atmosphere was very propitious. Whereas many Indians think that the atmosphere was colonialist and anti-Hindu, in reality at that time there was a strong pro-Hindu prejudice in Europe. You see, after the Enlightenment, the emancipation of some Europeans from Christianity, there was a very uh, strong pro-India feeling a certain Indomania, in which a number of important European thinkers considered India the homeland of European civilization. This included Voltaire, Immanuel Kant, and Johann Herder. They even thought so before this linguistic kinship was established. And so the news of this linguistic kinship arrived in a very proper, in a very propitious atmosphere. And so it was well received and nobody questioned it. Of course, India was the homeland. This lasted until about uh, 1820. In 1808, there was the book Language and Wisdom of the Indians by Friedrich Schlegel, in which this was all explained quite explicitly. So. India was the uh, guiding light at that time for many Europeans, and it is in that atmosphere that uh, the Indo-European kinship was conceived. It is for uh, very weak linguistic reasons that the homeland started shifting westwards. You see, as they studied the origins of this language family more closely, it seemed that still there was a certain distance between Sanskrit and the reconstructed ancestral language Proto-Indo-European. So, it was deduced, not very logically, that therefore there must also be a geographical distance between India and the homeland. I see a distance between Sanskrit and Proto-Indo-European translated into a geographical distance between India and the homeland. Now, of course, we do know that languages change all while staying in the same place. Like modern Italian is not the same as ancient Latin. Or modern Indian languages are not the same as ancient Sanskrit, of course. So, in fact, you see, this was a, an unwise uh, leap in the imagination. 
to assume that the homeland must therefore be outside India. Initially, it was still very close, namely Bactria, and that remained uh, a valid candidate uh, for the, the whole 19th century, well into the 20th century, like Max Müller favored it. But you see, once the homeland had left India, it could be really anywhere. And so many countries staked their claim, including non-Indo-European countries like Hungary. But so all the way to Germany, to Scandinavia, to the Balkans, countries raised their uh, candidacy. By the 1920s, gradually the favor went to uh, Russia, either White Russia with the Pripyat marshes, or uh, Russia itself, Russia proper, around the Volga River. And it is that theory that has won out, that until now is the dominant theory. Briefly in the 1990s, there was a rivalry with a theory of an Anatolian homeland, but most uh, linguists have rejected that. That's no longer a serious candidate. And so if modern Indo-Europeanists hear about a homeland debate, they think you are talking about the debate between Russia and Anatolia. Many of them have not even heard of India as a homeland candidate, or they have heard of it, but they don't take it seriously, either because it, they think it's silly, or because they have heard that it is favored by the ugly, vicious Hindu nationalists, and therefore must be opposed at any cost. And there is a certain stonewalling, a certain refusal to enter debate with the Indian homeland theory. Indian homeland theory, which has revived in the 1980s, principally due to the work of Karpasa by K.D. Sekhna. He uh, was the secretary of Sri Aurobindo long before. So back then, he, in the 80s, he was already an old man. But you see, he remarked that Karpasa, meaning cotton, was not yet present in the Rig Veda, but was already present in the Harappan cities. So his initial intuition was the Rig Veda is older than we thought. It is older than the high tide of the Harappan civilization. Then he gives some additional arguments anyway. It was enough to set minds in motion and revive the idea of India as a homeland. In parallel, there were also archaeological developments where archaeologists thought that, you know, somehow the proof of these Aryans moving into India fails to turn up. So since then, this theory has revived. And it was gradually favored by the Hindu nationalists, uh, mainly because the alternative theory, namely the Aryan invasion theory, had produced such negative political effects for India. Because, uh, I'll say this only in passing, but it should be realized that there has never been a more politically relevant uh, theory of, of history and of linguistics than the Aryan invasion theory. In the 19th century, it was already used by the British to justify their colonialism. In the 20th century, it became the main paradigm for the Nazi worldview. And then in India, it has been used by a number of political movements, the uh, Ambedkarites, the Dravidianists, and also by the Christian missionaries in order to divide and belittle Hindu society. So against that, Hindu nationalists have tried to support the refutation of an Aryan invasion and therefore the uh, support of the um, uh, Indian uh, Indian homeland theory. 
Now, let's look at the linguistic evidence. There is not much of it. You see, as I said, the decision by linguists to move the homeland away from India was taken on very flimsy grounds. And until now, indeed, even with a lot of new arguments appearing, the case, the linguistic case at least, for a non-Indian homeland is very weak. When you ask linguists at Indo-Europeanist conferences why they favor this, one answer I often get is, well, it gives a logical geographical distribution. You see, Russia, the Volga River, is just in the middle. It's equidistant from Bengal or Sri Lanka um, and from Portugal or Iceland. So that's nice. You see, they spread equally to the east and to the west. Now, it so happens that that is very exceptional. When you look at languages that have spread out, they have very rarely spread out symmetrically. The more usual scenario is that they spread out from one corner. For instance, Arabic now spoken all the way to Morocco, Mauritania, came from the east, from Arabia, did not expand to the east, but did expand thousands of miles to the west. Russian started in the area around Kiev, now in Ukraine, and it spread all the way east to Alaska. West, it didn't spread at all. Maybe Russians moved west, but there they came into well-populated countries like Germany, where they adapted. And so the Russian language was lost. Whereas in the East, they could expand all they wanted. Similarly, the Bantu languages in Africa, they spread along with the uh, technology of uh, agriculture. They started in about Nigeria, West Africa, and they spread all the way to South Africa. So they spread to the southeast. They did not spread to the north. Why not? Well, to the north is the Sahara Desert, where you can't practice agriculture. Now, like that, most human reasons for migrating are not symmetrical. You see, in this case, there is no symmetry between the south, where you can practice more agriculture, and the north, where you can't. Or in the case of Russian, there is no symmetry between well-populated areas where you lose your language and thinly populated areas where you can expand all you want. So, so the uh, situation is that uh, what you find in the European, if the homeland was in Russia, would be very exceptional. Now that proves very little, it just proves that it's unlikely but that doesn't mean impossible. So let's see what more we have. A somewhat difficult concept in linguistics is that of isogloss. It means that two languages have undergone the same evolution, which again not proves, but at least suggests that they have a certain history in common. Now, in the case of Indo-European, there are a few examples where they, uh, this consideration generates problems for the Russian homeland. For example, and I'll only give an easy example that everyone can follow, an initial s sound, like in septem in Latin, meaning seven, or seven in English, or sapta, in Sanskrit, often becomes ah, in some Western Indian dialects even, then in Iranian hafta, and in Greek hapta. Now, with the Russian homeland, you would expect the Iranians to move to the east and the Greeks to the west. 
So they have no history in common after their separation or after their migration from the homeland. Yet, you see, isoglosses like these, and there are more, suggest that they do have history in common. Now, if they originated in India, then they have history in common. They jointly moved westwards to Afghanistan, to Iran, and then they separated, but after having undergone some common developments. Then you have the issue of contact, and that should normally give a very important key. You see, contact with non-Indo-European languages. Now, in Europe, you hardly find any. Uh, even the Basque language, which was long thought, long thought of as the original Euro European language, turns out to be an immigrant language also, coming from the Caucasus. Um, and, but it was already in Europe before the Indo-European languages. So it has transmitted some words to the West European languages, principally to Celtic and to Germanic like the word silver or the word ice. Typically, a number of landscape elements, tree names, animal names, precisely what you suggest when a foreign population settles somewhere and takes over the words used by the locals. So that proves not very much, but at least it suggests that the homeland was not Western Europe because then all the other languages would also have borrowed from Basque. Same thing with the Semitic languages. Contrary to what you would perhaps expect, the Semitic languages were present in Western Europe, both the Berber language, now spoken in Morocco, Algeria, and the uh, actual Semitic language, principally Phoenician, because the Phoenicians, which is practically the same as Hebrew, because the Phoenicians colonized uh, Western Europe uh, anciently in the time before Christ. And so they too transmitted a few words to Germanic and Celtic. But again, you see that they did not affect the um, Indo-European languages as a whole. Then do you have anything on the Eastern side? Well, you have a whole, a whole uh, in fact, hundreds of words in common between the Uralic languages, like Finnish, Estonian, Hungarian, Samoyedic, and Iranian. But they are all one way. It is only Iranian that gave words to Uralic, not the other way around. In the Aryan invasion theory, what you would have had is, first of all, the Uralic languages and Proto-Indo-European were neighbors. So very probably you would see Uralic influence in all the members of Indo-European. That is certainly not the case. Or at least you would have the Indians and Iranians together trekking through Uralic territory and borrowing a number of Uralic words. That too is not the case. All you have is a number of Iranian words transmitted to Uralic. Now that is a typical scenario of colonization. What happened is that the Iranians coming from Afghanistan went west, went to Russia, in fact, all the way to the Danube, to Hungary. Uh, and there you see became the rulers and imparted many words to the reindeer herders that was mostly the occupation of the Uralic speakers. And so they transmitted very many words, like for example, uh, the Hungarian word sas, meaning 100, uh, obviously comes from uh, Iranian satan, meaning 100. Or for instance, a, a very telling interesting word is oria, in Finnish means a slave. But so originally it comes from the Iranian word Iria, meaning an Iranian. So you see an, enemy, an enmity between the two. And so at some point, some Iranians were captured in war and then used as slaves. 
okay? But so you see only a one-way traffic. There is, um, this has, among others, been pointed out by Sri Kantalagiri. Now there is no one in the West who wants to uh, take into account the contribution of Talagiri. Nevertheless, I do see some papers being published that, without mentioning him, are answers to Talagiri. And so he has pointed out, you see, it's a one-way traffic. Now there is a paper by uh, Václav Blazek about precisely this interchange where he points out that there is one word, just one, where probably you have a transmission from Uralic to Vedic Sanskrit, namely the word Gungu. Gungu means the um, crescent moon. There are, there are mentions a number of times in the Vedas about the three phases of the moon. And so the first one is Gungu. Now, the same word exists in Finnish, in Samoyedic, and so on, meaning the moon or the eclipse of the moon or anything related to the moon. So there may very likely be some, uh, some common origin. Though, Talage points out, if you uh, recognize layers in the Veda, then these verses with Gungu only appear in the late stages. Whereas, if they had brought this word in from Uralic territory into India, then you would have expected it in the early phases. So that's uh, already questionable. Moreover, it can just be coincidence. You see, in linguistics, you always have to take that into account. For example, the English word bad has the same spelling and the same pronunciation and the same meaning as the Persian word bad, which you find in, in Urdu, badamash, badanam, and yet they are not related. So once in a while you have these coincidental hits. So it may just be that. At any rate, it is not a valid argument against the one-way traffic. So very probably the Iranians were not native to any territory near the Uralic people, but later they colonized that territory. Now, is there any relation in the Far East? There are a few Indo-European words transmitted to Chinese. Like for instance, Chuan means a hound, a, a hunting dog. And you can clearly recognize Sanskrit Chuan or Greek Kyon. So that is a, a word borrowed and quite a few terms from uh, cattle raising have been transmitted from Indo-European to Chinese. But that uh, doesn't say much about the homeland because whether it is from, from uh, the Urals, from Russia, or from India, Afghanistan, you see, they would anyway have gotten close to China and as cattle herders, they could easily have transmitted their vocabulary to Chinese. That, unfortunately, cannot decide the homeland question. But there is another case that is quite interesting. It is Tibetan. This is presently being explored by a Russian scholar, uh, Igor Tonoyan Belyayev. And I think it has promise. He shows, for example, that you have in Tibetan the word pyug, which means cow, and which clearly, or apparently, is uh, the same root as of the Latin word pecus, which means cattle. This word pekus you would know in Sanskrit as pashu. Now the interesting thing is that the original Proto-Indo-European form has the k sound, pekus, which you find back in Tibetan pugs. 
By contrast, in Sanskrit, you have an evolved form, Pashu. So what Tibetan was in contact with was not Sanskrit, as it historically was, but was an earlier stage, namely Proto-Indo-European. So that seems to suggest that there was an old contact since the beginning between Proto-Indo-European and Tibetan. And that, of course, pleads for a North Indian homeland. Then there is an old um, linguistic consideration, namely that very early on, the Indo-European languages fell uh, apart into two different groups, the Kentum languages and the Satam languages. You have a Latin word, Kentum, which means 100, where from English words like century. And so you have Satam in Sanskrit, Shata, also meaning 100. Now, it was anciently thought that the Kentum languages were typical of the Western branches, Greek, Latin, Germanic, Celtic, whereas the Satam sound was typical of the Eastern branches, Slavic, Baltic, uh, Iranian, and Sanskrit. But it appears that the picture is more complicated. In the East, two Kentum languages have been discovered, namely Tocharian, spoken in what is now Xinjiang in China, and Proto-Bangani, spoken in the foothills of the Himalaya. Now, today they speak some kind of Hindi dialect over there, but it has a number of so-called substratum words, words borrowed from an earlier language, and they are typical Kentum words. They are early Indo-European. And so that suggests that Kentum was originally spoken in and near India. So the scenario we get is, first you had Kentum languages, all Indo-European languages or dialects or Kentum. Then some languages start moving away, taking this Kentum sound with them, like Celtic, like Germanic, like Latin. And some others also go away, but don't go to the west. You have Tocharian going to the east. And you have Proto-Bangani practically staying right there, but in an isolated place in the mountains. And then you get in the central country, namely in India, an evolution making Kentum into Satam. And so there, uh, Slavic, Iranian, Indian are affected and develop and stabilize around this Satam form. So the presence of these Kentum forms in Tocharian and Proto-Bangani, again, is something of an argument for an Indian homeland. Finally, you have the question of river names. River names are quite conservative, and mostly when a people settles in a new country, it takes over the native river names. Like in America, you have the Mississippi, Missouri. It's not exclusive. You also have the Hudson River, named after some British traveler. But still, you find lots of names borrowed from the natives. Now, if the Aryans had invaded India, you would expect something similar in Northwest India in the Vedic territories. And this is not the case at all. There you find exclusively purely Sanskrit words. Like, for example, Asikni. Asikni means black and is the name of one of the rivers in the Punjab. In fact, it's a very important name because um, on that is based the whole story that the Aryans were white invaders and encountered the black aboriginal. You see the name Asikni means black. And in the Battle of the Ten Kings, it is said that the Vedic Aryans under King Sudas have to fight the ten kings who are 
Asikni Jana, who are black people. Now, in fact, Asikni Jana in this case means the people from the Asikni. And it is explained in that whole story of, of the Battle of the Ten Kings that the Ten Kings come from the Asikni Basin, from that river valley. And so the interpretation in a racial sense is simply a mistranslation, but a very consequential one, because on that the whole idea is based that white invaders subdued the black aboriginals. The whole racial theory of Indian history and of caste is based on that mistranslation. Anyway, so we have a number of river names that are pure Sanskrit. Again, we see an attempt to refute this. You see, people like, uh, like Michel Donino, like uh, uh, Sri Kantalagiri, and like myself have pointed out you see, these river names are Sanskrit. That is a strong argument in favor of the Indian origin of Indo-European. So without mentioning anyone, a paper has recently been published arguing that, yes, these names look Sanskritic, but they may be folk etymologies overlaid on older forms. Uh, a well-known modern example is Brahmadesh, is a Sanskritic name for Burma. So what you have is Burma, a completely foreign name, Sino-Tibetan, and that is given a sort of Sanskritic reading as Brahmadesh. So who knows, maybe those river names are really hiding an underlying Burushaski name or Tibetan name or Dravidian name, who knows? Now, even this scholar, it is again the same uh, uh, Václav Blazek, uh, does not find alternatives for each of the names, but at least in some cases he does. Well, you see, all these things are possible. Any word may hide another word. But there is no proof of it. You know, it's a, it's a nice idea, but it's not based on anything solid. It may or may not be true. And at any rate, even he leaves open a number of cases where Sanskrit provides the only explanation. So altogether, it is not true that the linguistic approach of the Indo-European question necessarily implies an Aryan invasion, a homeland outside India. It, um, I think, rather supports an Indian homeland, but I have to add that it is only weak evidence. In one way or the other, it is certainly not decisive evidence, but it tends to favor an Indian homeland. The rest of the argument it will have to be decided by other types of evidence, archaeology, which again is also strongly pro an Indian homeland. Genetics may have a certain importance, but I wouldn't exaggerate it because people change language. And so, so much genes that do not determine the language he speaks or he brings. And then you have the literary evidence. And that nobody thought was possible. Everybody thought the uh, unity of Indo-European goes back like 6,000 years when there was no writing at all. And so we can't hope to have a human testimony that somehow indirectly uh, explains anything at all about this language split. In fact, uh, Sri Kantalagiri's work is unique precisely by showing that there is a literary testimony, namely the Rig Veda, which of course wasn't written down, but which was learned by heart. And as uh, the famous scholar Michael Witzel says, if you hear the Rig Veda being uh, recited today, it is like a tape recording from 
4,000 years ago. And so we do have a text that explains the Iranian migration from India. It's at the end of the Indo-European migration, but at least it is something. And it also contains reminiscences of an early emigration of the so-called Druhu tribe, which must be further uh, Indo-European branches leaving India. But so that is a, a subject in its own right. At any rate, it confirms what little that the linguistic evidence suggests. Thank you.